because the Arabs, they code Palestinians as people of color, therefore they have less power and therefore they have no agency and therefore they are inherently virtuous and can't be blamed for any of their actions. It's like, it's woke mind virus. Let's go. Welcome to Citizen. We've got a special guest today, author and journalist, Batia Ungar Sargan, which I now know what that means. I didn't realize you were part Indian. Yeah, I'm a quarter Indian. I feel like once people know that, they can see it in my face, um, is what I've heard. No, no, I don't believe no? that. Um, maybe, I don't know. I don't even, I don't, I don't know uh, what people look like. What the hell? Um, I found out something about your ancestry recently, but I don't know if you're out, if you're out about it. Oh, so out, yeah, I people know. I don't know if I can say it. But it's like, they know? yeah, well, I guess I've said it before. <laughs> <laughs> that um, my my maternal grandmother's Jewish, which by your fucking weird ass rules, like you tried to just wrote, for a non um, evangel evangelical group of religious people, you you do kind of try to loop some people in on technicalities from time to time. Yeah, when when we see someone we like, we don't let them go. I, I hate to break this to you, Dan, but you a Jew, man. <laughs> yeah, you know it is what it is. I went to therapy for it, and they couldn't fix me. Um, <laughs> We've been, we, we tried, we had a conversation before we started the show that you and I both have super fucked up senses of humor. So we're going to try to keep the weird Jew jokes to a, to a minimum, but it's probably not going to work. So, cause we're like a minute, 20 seconds in and we're already talking shit. <laughs> yeah, we're going to, we're going to try, uh, but apologies in advance if, uh, <laughs> no, nah, fuck that. Um, yeah, so, uh, let's, let's get for, it's been a while since we've had you on um yeah whew, fucking year and a half maybe i don't remember it's been it's been i think you were like wow. the second or third episode of this show if i'm not mistaken wow. um but a lot of stuff's happened since then a lot of stuff's always happening i mean in your world your job is to keep up with what's happening and then kind of um i i don't know put a put a lens on things for people to try to understand it. I mean, I get those comments a lot in my <clears throat> email and DMs, people are, that are like, I don't have time to keep up with the news, so thank you for kind of distilling it from mm. uh, this particular lens or that. Um, so tell me, let's let's go back to the beginning though. Tell me about your childhood. <laughs> um, it was very very Jewish. Mm. Um, but I have to say uh, about the difference between our jobs, my job is a lot less honest because your job is to give people who trust you your take on the news. Um, my job is literally to find multiple perspectives mm -hmm. on the news and publish them. So like literally I have to publish like every day stuff that I know is like totally <laughs> wrong because we do the daily debate at Newsweek. So every day we get two perspectives on on a on, on the big story of the day. Um and I feel a little bit like it's kind of a weird job. On the one hand, I think it's so important to like expose people to points of view that they mm -hmm. disagree with. And because it's a debate, people feel, I think, a lot safer to sort of contemplate the view they disagree with because it's right next to the view they agree with. But also it's kind of weird, especially like the last three weeks during this whole conflict, just like putting out op-eds. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's that's just totally wrong. <laughs> it's a weird job. Um, I kind of wish I had your job where I could just like just you know make anti-semitic jokes all day and other kinds of jokes and just tell people like who sucks mm. and why and shit on everybody because that yeah. seems a lot more honest it's a lot more fun i'll tell you that <laughs> um but you know i i don't uh, i don't i don't agree that it's not honest i mean it's kind of like um showing your work while you're doing a math problem, I think, right? You have to put all the information out there. And so I can, th so the, the, and then give context so the, the reader can find exactly where it started to go off the rails, right? Because like, oh, I love that. Every, yeah. every good, like every good piece of propaganda, every good lie is wrapped up in some amount mm. of truth, right? So you have to unpack the whole thing and see where the problem is. And then you can show it to people. I love that. I love that. That's a really nice um, framing of it. Do you are you one of these people who thinks like um, everybody is biased, nobody's objective, and therefore everybody has 
an agenda. And so there's no point in like striving for objectivity or striving for reporting things straight. You should just like lean into your point of view. Or do you think there's still like, like people should like the New York Times should still try to be like reporting the news straight. The fact that they're failing is like bad. Or mm. should they just like be like, look, we're liberals deal with it. Everything you read here is going to be liberal. End mm. of story. Well, I do think it would be nice if they would admit that. Yes, because it, uh -huh. it, that's important context for the reader. And, and I mean, we all kind of know it. But once you admit it, then you lay bare the context that you're providing. So that's that's right. one thing. Um, but. You, you said that the operative word in what you said is striving, right? Like in every foundational mm -hmm. document that makes sense to me philosophically, there's never an end state, right? It's always the journey that you're talking about. So in the Constitution and uh, uh, the Declaration of Independence, we're talking about a, a more perfect union, right? Which makes mm -hmm. the assumption that we're not going to achieve perfection, but we should always be trying to achieve that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So <sighs> certainly there is some objective truth. Uh, uh, we, we would we might call it epistemology, right? Like this, the mm -hmm. foundational facts that we all kind of agree on. That's becoming quite a bit muddy, uh, muddier certainly than it's ever been that I can remember. Um, but I don't think I, there's there's definitely utility to reporting through a particular lens, right? I mean, it, but it's like think about the way that think about the way that telescopes, terrestrial telescopes, work, right? Like on Earth. Um, the atmosphere distorts what we're looking at. So we have to make mathematical corrections so we can see what's really happening and we don't get uh, incorrect data. That's, in shooting, you might call it Kentucky windage, right? But it, it is, that's just a fact of life. I don't think it's mm -hmm. a good or a bad thing. It just is what it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, I think I agree with that. Like it's obviously like people come from a certain point of view, but um, you can you can give up completely on the idea of trying to say like, look, I can see this from a kind of outside perspective, right? Which is what unfortunately most of our media has done. Mm. Or you can be like, look, I know I have a certain orientation here. I know my, you know, to be aware of like your own biases so that you could be striving to be better at it. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah, but it's like, you know, the the problem is when, and this is something that we're dealing with these days, maybe more than ever. I mean, propaganda is not new. Um, yeah. Certainly. Yeah. Right. But um, yeah. it, it's opinion used to be very clearly opinion and not presented as fact. I mean, that's fundamentalism, right? Regardless of it, whether it's mm -hmm. religion or mm -hmm. not, it's still fundamentalism. If you think that your take on the world, you're making empirical claims about the universe and you don't have definitive evidence, right? That's widely accepted that what you're saying is true, then that's an opinion. That's how it works. Uh, but, and then you purport that your opinion is the fact and that it can't be challenged like the science, for example. And then we get yeah. into some fucking problems. So it's not, pe people say that it's the new religion, but that's just the way the human mind works. Like we, uncertainty is a big problem for us. I think it, I think it mm -hmm. causes us a lot of mental stress and that's what anxiety really is. You know, it's, it's uncertainty. Like I haven't, <sighs> I don't, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I don't know if I'm prepared that that's usually mm -hmm. where anxiety comes from. Um, and you know, people see it as an intrinsically bad thing, but I don't, I think it's just like a pain receptor. Like, yeah, it sucks, mm -hmm. but it's giving you a message. It's your brain and body telling you that you need to go do some work somewhere or something. Right. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I it would be nice if people would admit that what they're saying is their opinion. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it, it's, I don't know, but we're not living in the, those times anymore. That shit's over. And I, it's, it's unfortunate too, because maybe intentionally, or maybe, maybe this is just the way it happens, but it seems like it, it seems like it forces the other side to dig in and entrench in their position as well. And then that's it, right? There's no communication to be had after that. Think about the gun debate, for example. It's like, <clears throat> we can't have a legitimate conversation about this ever because the right is, and, and rightfully so, uh, concerned that the left is going to try to disarm the population. And you, you, people could say that's a conspiracy theory all they want, but it has been, I mean, look at Canada. Canada, so about a year ago, Trudeau said, we're going to stop the sale of handguns for a year. And 
uh, two days ago, they signed it into permanent law, right? That's that. It's like you can't trust these motherfuckers. So um, I, I don't believe that it's cons- conspiracy theory. I think it's pretty obvious that's what's happening. So from the right perspective, they're like, well, I'm not listening to any of that. Like my mm-hmm. my position is that the two ways absolute and we're never going to have a conversation. Like I agree with it, that the two ways absolute. <coughs> Excuse me. But there is some pretty. This this is a thought experiment that I like to to use on people on the right it's like um everybody knows at least one person that should not own a gun i think right or you can think of somebody like this asshole who shot up stuff in maine yesterday um had just spent the summer in a fucking insane asylum now he's running around with an ar-15 shooting people up probably should not have had that weapon right um Mm -hmm. but who do we let adjudicate that the state because we see what the state does with power. They weaponize it against their enemies. Mm-hmm. So we can't allow that. So we have to look for better solutions. I, I don't accept the solution that, well, that's just the way it is. So people just got to die. You know what I mean? Like there's still like we're, the, the citizenry needs to solve problems before the government shows up. That's, that's the crux of the argument there. But we can't even have that discussion because the two sides are so polarized. One is trying to get stuff done and the other one is trying to prevent that and that's just the battle right that's really interesting though i've actually never heard like a like a a conservative say no we all know people who really shouldn't have guns and like because it gets into a thorny thing on the one hand yeah i agree with you like the government we've seen like certainly over the last three years just how like it whenever they can they will weaponize whatever power they can sort of wrest from the citizenry you've been on this for Mm. forever probably but on the other hand, it's like, well, you can't say, well, we'll have like a community response to this where the community will get together and decide, well, this person really shouldn't have a gun. And so we're going to mobilize like and take away his property. Right. Because that's just theft. Right. So it's sort right. of like, how do you solve that that problem? Because on the one hand, I agree with you, like you you kind of really the, the idea of giving the government more power seems insane after what mm. we've just witnessed. But on the other hand. The, so what do you right? What do you do with that fact? Is do you think that there could be like a private sector, like a citizen, you know, council established to to take care of that kind of a thing? Um, disarming the individual that's that's a problem, but stopping uh-huh. them, stopping people from acquiring weapons that are fucking crazy, I think is something we should think about. Right mm-hmm. now, uh, you know, so that's that's the crux of the debate, though. It's like once. Once somebody on one side of an argument hears one thing about a solution that right. they don't like, they shut it down. Right. But right, you know what right. I mean? It's like, well, yeah. but we still haven't solved the problem. So think about it this way. Um, <clears throat> if you had cancer and you're like, well, I don't want to do radiation. I don't think that's the right thing to do. It's like, all right, cool. So uh, let's explore these other, op- the other options. Like, no, no, I'm against it shall not be infringed motherfucker so i'm just gonna die of cancer now Mm -hmm. you know what i mean that's a retarded way to go through life frankly um you're saying if you were not debating like leftists you could find your way around to something like a background check if they weren't the ones pushing for it um i mean i don't don't know about specifically Uh. what what it would be right but it's it's a conversation that needs to be had and frankly with, with regard to to violence of any sort gun violence included it is primarily uh when, well when we're talking about these mass shooting stuff uh it's it's always a mental health issue right nobody mm-hmm. no sane person wakes up in the morning is like you know what i just got fuck i don't even have to be to work until three today let's go shoot up a school right that's dumb people don't think that way um but so so that that's a that's a difficult problem to solve mm-hmm. and the vast majority of murders happen uh uh between young black men and other young black men in inner cities. Yeah. We, we don't talk about that. I mean, there's, oh. <clears throat> there were 22 people killed last night in Maine. That's an average weekend in Ch- South Chicago, like seriously. That happens every week. So we don't talk about that because, you know, it's not, I, I guess it's not sexy. And I don't want to accuse people of not caring about it. I, I just, I don't, I don't think, well, maybe they don't, I don't know, but that this is the the crux of the problem as soon as somebody offers a solution to the problem that you don't like you tend to shut down and reject that it's even a problem it's like well that's not true right right um, right right i hear what you're saying yeah so, the, I, the yeah. reason that we don't we don't talk about um urban 
crime is because it's committed by blacks and in the in the woke worldview people of color have no agency and so Mm -hmm. you can't point out when they do bad things um because it embarrasses white progressives and actually it's very relevant to what's going on now in the coverage of the middle east which is you know why these leftists are suddenly coming out in support of you know these mass raping uh, baby mutilators hamas and it's because like they so to them the because the arabs they code palestinians as people of color therefore they have less power and therefore they have no agency and therefore they are inherently virtuous and can't be blamed for any of their actions it's like it's woke mind virus Mm. on fire and so what they're doing now is they're trying to retrofit a crime to these israelis that would justify like the brutal their brutalization and so they start accusing israel of committing a genocide because that's how they justify these heinous acts that cannot be blamed on the people who committed them because they have dark skin like it's literally that sick and and messed up but i know you and i don't 100 percent see eye to eye on this issue um because i remember like right in the beginning i was like "Ooh, what's dan talking about (laughs) what what was it that i said that you didn't like (laughs) I think it's this. Okay. And I'm actually like really curious what you think about this because like I know that we are very um, aligned on the question of like um, foreign aid, funding for Ukraine, for example, Mm -hmm. wars, foreign wars, being involved in foreign wars. Um, And I think that there is a kind of tendency on like in the kind of America first camp to see aid to Israel as the same as aid to Ukraine. And I think that I see it very differently. Like, obviously, okay, I'm sitting here with this huge Jewish star. Like, obviously, I'm not like totally objective here. And I'm just going to completely admit that. But I, I, I've been asking myself all this time, like, am I just a total hypocrite? Because I'm very against funding the war in Ukraine. And I think that we should be sending military assistance to Israel, although definitely not boots on the ground. I think that would be a massive mistake. And I think that would be very bad for Israel and very bad for America. I think the difference is this. Like, I think um, Israel actually is an ally that's pulling its weight. And the way that you know that is because, A, they don't need boots on the ground. And B, um, they are actually a strategic ally in the fight against Iran. Like, our our focus should be on China right now. It should not be on Russia and it should not be on Iran. Like, there actually is a country that is trying to destroy us. And But we, we do have... Um, we, there is a new axis of evil forming. Um, you know, Iran, China, and Russia are now um, very much aligned against our interests. But we cannot fight those three wars, and we shouldn't be fighting those three fronts. We should be focused on China, and we should be bolstering allies who actually bring something to the table and can provide a front for us that we benefit from in a really big way. And I think that Israel is very capable of doing that because they actually are capable of fighting Hamas and Hezbollah on their own. Like they actually can 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 handle that if they have enough artillery. They actually have shown over the last 70, 80 years that they can take on five Arab countries at once. Mm. And I think the the real proof of, of this, again, like I could just be a complete hypocrite, probably am, but like to me, there was a kind of proof for my thesis that they're an ally that's actually capable of pulling its weight. Um, because a couple days ago, um, this, uh, Saudi Arabia shot down um, a Houthi, which is the Iran-backed separatist in Yemen, a Houthi drone that was headed towards Israel. And of course, like the Saudis didn't do that because, you know, they hate terrorism and they have love in their hearts for the Jewish people. They did that because they freaking hate Iran mm. and they see Israel as worth aligning with in the fight against Iran. I mean, so that was to me was like, Oh, if Saudi Arabia is looking at this situation and thinking like, okay, we know who we want, which pony we want to back in this race, and it's Israel, like that is very good for America. And they didn't do that as a favor to us either. So I think like that's why Israel is different. And that's why like we should be making sure that they have the ability to fight that fight because they're fighting it for themselves, but also for us. And but again, uh, troops on the ground, like the reason that that Iran 
supported Israel, uh, Hamas. I don't know how much they supported them. I don't like fully buy the that they admitted that they planned this Hamas attack. But the reason that, that this happened was because they wanted to stop Saudi Israel uh, normalization. Mm-hmm. They wanted Israel to look weak. And if we send troops on the ground to Israel, Israel will look weak and they really need to look strong right now. And so I would completely, completely oppose anything of that nature. But I just think it's it's so different from the Ukrainian situation where we're funding this thing that Putin literally like begged NATO, don't make me do this. Mm-hmm. Like, don't make me do this. The easiest way to keep me out of here, like he gave them all of the warning they needed. He offered to end the, the war two weeks in e- the easiest terms possible status quo. And we just keep funding this country that will never be a Western democracy. It's like one of the most corrupt countries on the planet and acting like they're going to be an ally that can pull their own weight when it's basically just a money pit that's making the world less safe for us and pushing Russia and Putin further to China when they could have been an ally for us against China. That's my okay. But I'm really curious what you think about this. You know so much more about so many of these issues than me. And so you're very well equipped to tell me if I'm just like full of shit and a total hypocrite. As my people sometimes are. Um, <laughs> you, do you mean Hungarians or Indians? <laughs> um, uh, well, I'll, here's I'll, a number of things on that. I'll start in kind of reverse order. I think that regional uh, hegemony is quite a bit better than the U.S. being the global police force. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there, there's something about, there, there's a reason that we've been been building castles and castle walls, you know, for 10,000 years now, mm-hmm. because that's an easy to defend position. And you can extend it out to some degree, but you can't extend it out everywhere. Now, one of my questions would be, what, what threat does uh, Iran actually pose to the United States? And there are some pretty like we, we're seeing some of the stuff now. One of the reasons that the that the U.S. has asked Israel to delay their ground invasion of Gaza is because they want to shore up their defenses for U.S. assets globally. Right. Um, that's what I'm hearing from the State Department. So <clears throat> why are we in those places exposed to foreign threats in the first place is something that I would ask. Like, I don't this isn't victim blaming like oh what we do to deserve this or what did the what did israel do to deserve this that's nonsense but it is like how are we intentionally or unintentionally exposing ourselves to threats that's forcing our hand to do these other things Mm -hmm. i think that's a mistake strategically right Mm -hmm. um now it doesn't change the situation it's not like we're going to roll back all of our embassies and shit now so there's nothing to be done about that but i do think i think europe should solve europe's problems and i think the Arab world should serve, solve the Arab world's problems. Jordan and, I mean, this is what Trump was working on, right? Yeah. Um, say whatever you want to about his uh, <laughs> his uh, creepy fucking son-in-law that's, uh, I'm not a huge fan of the guy, but the peace deals between, you know, Qatar and uh, Kuwait and fucking uh, uh, UAE and what was the other one? Fuck. There was a... There was a Bahrain. F- Bahrain, yeah, um, which nobody ever talks about Bahrain when they're talking about <laughs> stable Middle East countries. It's like one of the nicest countries out there. But anyways, um, yeah, those peace deals he negotiated between all those guys and Israel and then the Saudi Arabia one that was going to be the fucking, I guess, I guess the, the final blow there, really smart, right? It's like yeah. these countries, they have members of their respective royal families who are Wahhabist for sure that, I mean, Saudi Arabia – didn't just fund 9-11, they planned it, right? They, they're they the ones right. that attacked us in the same way that Iran just attacked Israel. But, you know, having those alliances, I think, is important, but I think it's a regional issue. If we can, if we can advise and assist and economically, to some degree, and, and be involved in that stuff, then it's probably in our interest. But um, I, I, and in that way, Israel is a strategic ally in that particular fight, but I don't think they're an ally of the United States at all. Like, what, what is it exactly that they provide us except for... Here, here's... Stay with me for a moment. We, first of all, we give them $3 billion a year just off the cuff, right? For whatever they choose to spend it on, which I well, think... Well, is... m- most of that gets spent 
like with Lockheed Martin. So the (laughs) Israel, right? So like uh, they have to spend that in the American economy by buying American fighter jets, which, okay, so maybe, you know, that doesn't help us as citizens that Lockheed Martin gets gets richer, but that is spent in the American economy. And also just a little tiny thing, which is at some point Israel had this project called Project La Vie where they wanted Mm. to design their own fighter jet and the Americans could sort of convince them not to, they didn't want them developing that side of, their economy because they felt that, you know, long term, then, you know, it, it's ever happened that these Arab countries would normalize relations, they'd go to Israel to buy this stuff instead of to us. So in a way, they did make that sacrifice in order to have this relationship with us. But yeah, go on. I mean, you're right. I mean, it's not it's they, we do give them a lot of money. And it's yeah. it comes from American taxpayers. Yeah. And, and they don't, yeah. aside from being a lightning rod in the region, I'm not sure what exactly Israel provides to us. There's an old saying in the intelligence community, Israel is an ally, but not a friend. They spy Mm -hmm. on us at the same rates as Russia and China. They have spies all over the United States. You're probably one of them. Um, (laughs) um, (laughs) I couldn't, I couldn't help it. Uh, But yeah, it's like, uh, I I don't, I don't, uh, but, but here's the other crux of this problem. A great portion of, well, pretty much everybody in Congress with maybe two exceptions are either, uh, uh, in bed with the fucking military industrial complex to some Mm -hmm. large degree and then also privately investing in that stuff. Or they are like evangelic Christians who think that they're taking, they they think like this has got to, there's there's some weird psychology going on here where they think they're part of the end times now. They're living in revelation and they're going to like Joe Biden probably thinks this way because he made some stupid comment about it the other day. Probably thinks, well, if he does think indeed, uh, which is, debatable, I guess, but um, he probably thinks like, oh, I'm a big player in the fucking Bible now, man. I'm a fucking historical character now. It's like, all right, guy. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think uh, U- U.S. involvement in this stuff, I agree with you. It's it's problematic. And I wonder, you know, but here's, here's an issue that I've been having. The, uh, and you and I have talked about it, but the moral equivalence, like this, this whole idea that um, Palestinians are somehow uh, like uh, pe- people try to compare it to like chattel slavery or something like that, or or an internment camp, right? But right, they call Gaza an open air prison. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I don't know. I don't know about that. I mean, there have been multiple times. So <clears throat> I've had these debates with people recently. It's like, well, they've never, like, Israel never should have existed as a state in the first place. It's like, all right, I mean, you can have that debate, I guess, but Britain owned it. They owned it because they conquered it, and that's how the fucking world works, bitch. Like, if you don't think that that's how the world works, what's, what country are you in? If you're in, the, if you're in the Arab world, the Ottoman Empire conquered that shit, and they took it back from fucking uh, Macedonians or Greeks or whomever else, right, at some point. So it, at one point it belonged to Southern Europeans, you know what I mean? And now it belongs back to you and whatever the fuck. That's just how the world works. So all of the arrangements that were made back in the day to divide up that land seemed relatively preferable, right, to both sides, I think, Um it was just yeah, it's so that, weird to me, like when conservatives are not like when when people on the right are mm. like Israel shouldn't exist. It's like they managed to win wars repeatedly mm. against five Arab countries that were trying to annihilate them. Like, I thought you guys were on the side of like, you know, like, you know, you win a war and mm. then <laughs> there's like, you know, the borders are redrawn. It's yeah. kind of. Yeah, I mean, um, that's that is kind of how it works, I think. I mean, not not I yeah. think that is how it works. So, you know. <clears throat> And then, you know, multiple times after that, in, in lieu of whatever peace plan was going to be put in place, the PLO or whomever else, right, whatever proxy they were fighting on behalf of, decided to, um, decided to choose violence instead, right? Because I think, yeah. and, and they say it out loud, like I, I don't hear any Israelis or Zionists who aren't Israel, Israeli talking about the annihilation of the Arab world. I've never heard anybody say that, to be honest. And you can see the evidence of that because there's two million Arabs that live in Israel. And 
get along just fine so far as I can tell. You know what I mean? Um, so the, the two sides are not equal is the point of that. Um, one side is has entered modernity in the same way that even evangelic Christians now, there's stuff in the Bible that they choose to ignore. You know what I mean? There, there's part of their right. theology from back in the day that they choose to ignore because it's incompatible with modern life. The Arab world, to a large degree, has not done that. Now, there are some exceptions. Jordan is pretty good. Bahrain's pretty good. Kuwait still has a caste slave system with Indo Indonesian people. But, I mean, as, as far as, like, general civil rights for their own citizens, it's, it's relatively normal there. So there's, there's exceptions. But for the most part through the Middle East, they've chosen to stay in the fucking 7th century. You know what I mean? Um, and it is what it is. Like, that's your right to do that. I don't, I don't think that it benefits America in any way to get involved in that shit. You know what I mean? It's like if there's a crazy person on the other side of town, you don't go fucking hang out and wait for him to start <laughs> shit and then fuck them up. You stay away from that part of town, right? Like, and, and when somebody from that part of town tries to come to your country, you say no. It seems pretty simple to me. We need to lock our fucking borders down and stop pretending like, like we, we've swum, we've swimmed out or swam, swimmed, swum. I don't know the fucking word. Uh, we've, we've gone out into the warm ocean water and we're now getting attacked by sharks and we're calling the sharks assholes for it. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. that's your land. Iraq, do whatever the fuck you want. Iran, do whatever the fuck you want. But if you come to my property, I'm going to shoot you in the face. I feel like that's... Uh, I, I, I am a bit of an isolationist in that regard because mm -hmm. I think it's a more appropriate way to handle business. And I don't believe in sanctions or any of that bullshit. It only hurts the people. You know what I mean? Uh, look at North Korea. Like, those people are fucked forever because of, you know, the way their government's set up. They have no hope of ever overthrowing that government because they have no idea what's going on. I just don't What What are we doing? <sighs> like, our relationship with um, with Israel historically has caused us a lot of problems. That doesn't mean we should cut it off or anything like that because mm -hmm. I think it is, like, Israel has a right to exist and a right to defend itself in whatever means it sees fit, but... Um, you know, how is it benefiting the U.S. exactly? I, I, from your perspective, how do you think, aside from, because I don't think, I don't believe this about, I don't believe this stuff about how, well, Iran's going to do X, Y, Z if we don't do that. Like, what the fuck is Iran going to do? Get on battleships and come to America? No, that's, they don't even have battleships. So what the fuck are they going to do? Right. Um all incredibly important questions that I can sort of answer, but mm. probably not to your satisfaction. But um, so first of all, the U.S. refused to help Israel in 1948. Um, the U.S.-Israel relationship only started warming up in 1967, which was when Israel successfully fought off again these five Arab states and when things started to shift in the direction where America started to think, oh, it's important for us to have some sort of sphere of influence uh, you know, in, in that when they were fighting communists, basically, <laughs> like they they started to think like, right, again. So, yeah, you're totally rolling your eyes. Yes. Cold War, et cetera. Mm. But the, the, the U.S. Israel relationship started um, under perhaps a misguided, but under like the America was not there for Israel when it was facing annihilation in 1948. They started mm. to warm up to Israel when they thought Israel had something that it could offer. Now, of course, 80 million evangelicals, like you said, it's not nothing. A lot of um, support for Israel at the political level is no doubt driven by the fact that evangelicals see their destiny as bound up with the Jewish people. Um, and, you know, that's not something that, you know, I mean, I think it's crazy for, for Jews to not be grateful for them because, you know, there's we faced a lot of bad countries and this is not one of them. This country's always been incredible to Jews and very protective of us. Um, but so in terms of what do they provide now and the question of Iran, it's such an important question because, yeah, you're right. Iran is not going to bomb us. We saw with like through Obama that they were trying to like cozy up to us, mm -hmm. like they wanted to have a good relationship with us. And Obama, who really didn't like Israel was like, great, let's make that happen. Um, I, I think the answer is like is again is with China. Um, like that 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 relationship is always going to be stronger than whatever we can, you know, cobble together with Iran. They are always going to be um, supporting China. The relationship between China and Iran is extremely strong. Strong. China came out on the side of Hamas after the atrocities mm -hmm. of October seventh, and China is our number one enemy. And so, like to me, it's sort of you're right. They're they're not going to Iran's not going to send a nuclear a nuclear bomb at America, but it's never going to be 
um, an ally of the U.S., its interests are always going to be opposed to ours. And I, I think I know that you have complicated feelings about Donald Trump, but I think his foreign policy was so spot on. Like what Biden's doing now, Israelis are very grateful for it. They feel like he's been extremely supportive. I feel like he's been very supportive. But I think that Biden, like Obama, he likes his allies weak because that makes them de- dependent and that mm. makes them pliable. And I think Trump likes his allies strong because he thinks that weakness is lame and he wants his friends to be not lame, especially if they're in photographs with him. He doesn't want to be photographed with people who he thinks are weak. He doesn't want to be associated with people who he thinks are weak. And so when I look at what did the Trump doctrine look like? Well, um, yeah, he, I don't think he would have funded this war in Ukraine. That's very clear. He felt that we should be, you know, trying to make friends with Russia rather than alienate them. He wanted to get out of of Afghanistan. Of course, he he was rolled over by the State Department. But, you know, no more foreign wars. Let's get rid of NATO. I love when he says that. I don't know why we're funding that organization. I don't know why it exists. There's no more Soviet Union. It's absolutely ridiculous that we are funding NATO. He mm. was spot on about all those things. But also, he really, really, really wanted to be a close friend of Israel. And, you know, you could say that moving the embassy was, you know, a deal he made with Sheldon Adelson, you know, in, in exchange for $150 million during the campaign. Probably the move the embassy like that's true i mean you know that 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 does seem to be like a a promise he made for the money but but after that um you can see that in the in his approach to the middle east that he felt it was very important that israel um see him as a friend and to me that suggests that he saw israel as strong like he saw it as um somebody that the u.s country the u.s could rely on to protect our interests in the region and i've spoken to people which i mean you probably know more than i do about this but i've spoken to people have told me like you know classified stuff about ways in which israel does help the u.s in terms of you know our our ability to be in that region you're right israel spies on america america spies on israel right it's very you know you're it's 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 a great point that it's an ally and not a friend um i certainly see my you know i'm american and so i'm America's interests come first for me all the time. Um, But at the same time, I do think that there is a case to be, you know, people think that um, like I've seen Tucker Carlson discussing this on his show, right, that that if we support Israel, we are effectively entering World War Three. And what we should be saying to Israel is this is your fight. This is not our fight. We don't want to start World War Three. That to support Israel is to goad Iran into a war in which they see themselves as fighting us. But I really think it's the opposite. I think that the more we can support Israel and in it taking on Hamas and Hezbollah, the less likely we are to see Iran waging war against us, getting involved in this war, because you can rely on Israel to stand up for itself. It is it's never going to ask for boots on the ground and it's never going to ask for more than simply the artillery that it needs in order to wage this war on its own. And I think that's really what you've seen. I, I think that Biden has been giving Netanyahu cover. Now, I don't think Bibi said I don't think uh, Biden said to Bibi, you can't do this ground invasion. I think the Israelis wanted to wait. Mm. And I think Biden gave them cover. And I I appreciate that because I think he took a lot of heat for like he allowed the narrative to come out that he was the one keeping them from invading. But I think that they were really trying to push off this ground invasion because they're leveling buildings that are on top of the tunnels. They're preparing the way they're getting rid of the booby traps. They're minimizing the casualties on their end, which and they gave 750,000 Gazans were able to move to southern Gaza. So they 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 got rid of many. They enabled many of the civilians who would have been casualties to leave. And I think that that kind of taking a beat And gathering themselves, you know, instead of going in in the heat of the moment right after the attack, like it's it's so great that they took that time. And um, I just think it's I I don't know that they're behaving rationally. I don't trust Netanyahu at all. Netanyahu has for his entire career for the last two, three decades built up Hamas very intentionally Mm. because he wanted to weaken the Palestinian peace camp, the Fatah peace camp that operates mostly in the West Bank. And so he felt that if you divide and conquer the Palestinians, he won't have to worry about a Palestinian state. And so he was very active in building up Hamas. And I I think you're going to see a lot of Israelis blaming him for the attack and and what happened when the dust settles. Mm. But um, yeah, in general, I think the the I, I you know, I think Trump has really good foreign policy instincts and that he correctly saw Israel as a very strong ally that was that would be able to protect us. But I, I think all the questions you're asking are totally legitimate. Like, I don't think that, you know, 
I, I think, say, you know, saying we shouldn't enter World War Three, totally legitimate. But I, I think, you know, J.D. Vance has a bill out today, I think, where he's saying we need to decouple aid for Israel and aid for Ukraine. And I, I, I think that he's right about that. And I think they are different. But again, possible I'm just a complete hypocrite on this. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think you're a hypocrite. I mean, it's <laughs> it's it's not an easy solution here, obviously. Um, yeah. But I, uh, from a tactical perspective, I'm not sure I agree with uh, it's a good yeah. idea to hold off on a ground invasion. Mm -hmm. um, one, it's, it's not right to say indiscriminate bombings, but it does have an effect, right? I mean, civilians are going to get killed. Um, and I don't, I don't accept that. I wouldn't accept it for my country either. I, I think you it's, wouldn't. I think, no, I think it's, I think it's immoral. Um, I'm an operator. I fucking shoot. I'm a gunfighter. You know what I mean? Put mm -hmm. me on the ground and let me go gunfight. I can tell the difference uh, between uh, a fucking civilian and a, and a, and, and, and a fucking terrorist. Uh, and I'm willing, I, it's as, as soldiers, we're supposed to put ourselves at risk before women and children. And I think it's unacceptable mm -hmm. to not do that. Frankly, I think it's mm -hmm. cowardly. I don't, I'm not saying that Israel itself or the soldier or the mm -hmm. IDF are cowards, but I think that is a cowardly move. And I'm a very not cool with that. Um, I, I just don't think like there's no, if, if a woman picks up a gun and starts pointing it at me, I'll blow her brains right out of the back of her head. I have no qualms with that. Right. Um, but if I kick a door down and go into a house and it's women and children with one terrorist, I'm going to shoot that bitch in the face. You know what I mean? And then leave the rest of them because it, even if they're providing material support, that's not, we're not, this isn't the fucking middle ages anymore. We don't operate that way. It's not world war one you know, where we just fucking mustard gas and carpet bomb shit. Not that they're carpet bombing. I don't believe that. That whole hospital story was complete bullshit. Um, I didn't make any comments on it for the first couple of days because it felt like bullshit. And it turns out that <laughs> one of the dudes that was filming himself getting bombed, he's a total crisis actor. I found a bunch of other videos of him. I don't, I don't know if you've seen this guy yet, but I'll send it to you. It's really fucking funny. I mean, it's funny in like a get the fuck out of here kind of way. Right. right. Um, so I don't. I know there's a massive tunnel system. It's probably booby trapped. It is difficult to fight an enemy that doesn't care if they die. There's no question about that. So, or it doesn't care if they're women or children, sure, like intentionally, 100%. like, like literally they're trying to take their human shields into the world to come with them. Cause mm -hmm. like they, they think, I don't know, maybe Allah will be confused. Like, I don't understand the thinking, but they are, it's, I think it's important. I hear everything you're saying, but I think it's important to stress, like they are still shooting rockets oh, yeah. at Israel, like from behind women and children mm -hmm. and i you asked me or like a couple weeks ago like you said is there a point at which there will be so many civilian casualties you will no longer support israel's you know response and i think that's a really important question like at what point is it too much mm -hmm. so i i didn't i should have realized at the time that for you like no civilian casualties are acceptable for a military operation well i would rather die myself frankly mm -hmm. um like it's, but may, people aren't always like that, I guess. You know what I mean? And, you know, it's, I, but that's I think the it's luxury like I of, could, I, that's the luxury of being a gunfighter on the ground and not a person that's in charge of thousands of people. You know what I mean? Because you have to make. Yeah, but all, if I was in charge of your platoon, I think I could say as an American, I am, I cannot go to your mom and say, I would be, I said he should die because the person shooting at him was surrounded by. I don't I think that there's um, like I could see you making that decision for yourself, but I think a country could say like I think as an American, if I had to make that decision, I don't know that I would. I don't I don't know that that's the right. I mean, I don't know that that's I've been struggling with this a lot. Right. Like, I, you know, I'm religious, so I, I think human life is infinitely precious, every human life. Right. But clearly, I think that some level of civilian casualties is acceptable after you commit a, an atrocity like like happened on October 7th. Now, in 2014, I, I think I, w I was on your side. I was saying what you were saying. So in 2014, Hamas started lobbing rockets into Israel. There was maybe 100 of them, and I think maybe two people were killed. And Israel then bombarded and killed, I think it was 1,500 and 500 of them were children. And at that time, I said, you can't kill 500 children when their rockets are only capable of killing one person. Mm. Like that's disproportionate. Like I really felt that like morally in my bones. Like Israel has a defensive mechanism. It has the Iron Dome. Like that is how it defends itself. It doesn't need to kill so many people to defend itself. 
Um, but I feel very differently this time around. And I think it's because they, um, I, you know, it's funny because people on the right are accusing me of being such a naive lunatic back then. They're like, they were Nazis back then. You, ju They just didn't have the capacity to like do it the way that they did it this time around. And I'm thinking a lot, like, was I totally wrong? But I, I don't think I, I think I would, I would be myself in 2014 if once again they became in incapable of truly doing much damage. Although to the Israelis, they say, well, we have to run with our children to the bomb shelters every 10 minutes. Like, mm. that's not a life. Like, you have to ha be able to put a stop to that. Like, I don't think most Americans would accept that as just like daily living or daily life. Well, so, no, but they would move to the yeah. suburbs, right? They wouldn't stay yeah, where I they mean, are. Yeah. They wouldn't, they would be dispassionately moved to the suburbs, frankly. Right, and right. I know it's less. That's a lot. That's quite a bit less complicated to move from the south side to the north side of Chicago. But, um, uh, you know, it, it's yeah, the, it, people, you guys are pretty romantic about. You're, yeah, that you're piece like of there would be white flight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's probably what they would be accused of. Like the Jews are going to get heat no matter what. Um, but I think to your point about that, I don't think governments can be trusted to make those decisions. It's the same line of thinking that led to the GWAT, um, and you know probably a million civilians in Iraq died as a result. Um, just in Iraq, who knows about Afghanistan? I mean, they don't track anything up there, right? It, it's it's like a, compared to uh, compared to Afghanistan, Iraq is like a metropolitan area. Um, right, but Dan, we weren't protecting our homeland then. Like the Israelis are protecting their homeland. Mm -hmm. Like it's very different. Like we were, we didn't belong there. Like we had, we were just, we didn't belong there. I think it's, it's, you don't think that's a difference that matters? I, I think that if you can use a righteous cause to do unrighteous things, then you'll, mm -hmm. you'll fabricate righteous causes, uh -huh. right? Um, so like, just think about mm -hmm. Obama, the, the drone campaigns that he ran, thousands of civilians were killed mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, thousands of people were killed. And uh, estimates are that 90% of them were civilian, right? Um, that that's unacceptable. It doesn't matter what yeah. the cause is. I don't think. I, I mean, agree with. But you. then you know, I mean, th I, I can see the counter to that too. Like Hiroshima, and Nagasaki, for example, the Empire of Japan was going to fight to the last man. The, the mm -hmm. last time we faced an enemy that didn't care about casualties and were willing to not at, down to the individual level, right, die themselves without regard for their lives or sacrifice the people around them as well, uh, was Japan, and we had to nuke two of their cities to fucking stop that shit. So I, I get it. I get it. So I have the luxury of being a gunfighter and not being a decision mm -hmm. maker. You know what I mean? So I, I don't envy those people. But mm -hmm. um, it, it is a far more complicated situation now. You're right. Israel is definitely just kind of protecting its, its right to live here. Um, now they've – Israel has operated in the area in the same way that NATO has operated in northern Europe, right, continuing to gobble up more land and things like that. Um, how do you feel about that? Because it's it, it is I, I think it is a very shallow provocation, frankly. It's like, oh, I'm sorry that you're the, the fucking empty parking lot next to you didn't have a house on it. So we built a house and lived there like you. You really hate us that much that you, we can't even be neighbors. That's kind of what I get from it. Right. Because um, I guess here's the question. Why won't. We, we established this before, about 1.9 to 2.1 million Arabs live in Israel proper. Um, and it seems to be fine, right? Nobody seems to give a shit. Um, and there's a, quite a few Palestinians in Jordan, but nowhere else. I, I guess there's some in, in Lebanon as well, but quite a few Palestinians in Jordan. 60% of the population, I think, is, is Palestinian uh, because that's where they came from originally, Transjordan. Uh, but... Aside from Jordan, everybody else in the in the Middle East has kicked these people out, including Egypt. So Africa as well. They've kicked them out of their countries. Do you have a theory on why that is? Because I've got my, I've got a theory. I think uh, I want to hear your theory. I think it's hilarious that Sisi will not let a single ninety-year-old Palestinian lady cross the Rafa crossing because he is so certain that every single Palestinian, every three-year-old child, is carrying water for Hamas, or at least. He's not willing to find out like and nobody gives Egypt a hard time for this. Like literally, they won't take a single refugee in Lebanon. Palestinians don't have civil rights like yeah, they literally they can't buy and property, nobody they can't cares. get professional certifications, can't get jobs, stuff, nothing. Huh? 
and nobody cares. I mean, no. nobody like obviously like there's a level of anti-Semitism there where sure. it's like, you know, I, I don't feel great about the the settlements in the West Bank because I think that they like basically the West Bank and Gaza became under Israeli rule after they won the 1967 war. They did not intend to occupy the West Bank. Um, what happened was the Israelis were fighting off the Jordanians. And when they got to that border, to the, the, the Jordanians fled. And so, you know, some little schmo called his com commander and said, hey, what am I supposed to do? They're running. And he said, advance to Jerusalem. And so they advanced to Jerusalem and they retook Jerusalem. And of course, like Jerusalem has so much meaning to Jews, like historically. Um, but at the same time, what they established, there was a military occupation because mm -hmm. it was meant to be temporary. And so they did not give the Arabs who live their citizenship. So you're totally right that the 20, 25 percent of Israelis who are Arabs, they're full citizens. They have mm -hmm. totally equal 99 percent of the same rights as Jewish Israelis. But in the West Bank, they don't have the right to vote for the Israeli government, even though the Israeli military will exercise, you know, it's, you know, will will exercise state power against them. Mm -hmm. So that's like a big problem. And for as long as it was like, okay, this is temporary. We got to figure out how we're going to live with these people. They keep bombing our buses. They keep, you know, killing our children. Like, how are we going to, they keep rejecting our offers to give, make them their own state four times. They were like, no, this is not good enough. This is not good enough. But then what Israel started doing was encouraging Israelis and Jewish Israelis to move there and establish settlements on that land where they had civil rights and yet they were living next to people who didn't. And that is deeply, deeply, deeply problematic. Now, does that justify um, mass rape, setting babies on fire, tying a parent up and then dismembering their child in front of them limb by limb? Of course not. But, you know, the situation um, was unsustainable and very, very bad. The, the Gaza situation is different because um, there actually was an, a parliamentary election. Hamas won. And then it basically a stat, there was a coup. They took all of the members of Fatah and threw them off the roof of the building with all the gays. And they established a dictatorship, basically, both in the West Bank and Gaza. There mm -hmm. haven't been elections in 15, 20 years. So there's like it'd been this dictatorship. Of Hamas. Was the last one. 2006. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, at, at, it's very difficult. Um, so they at, at some point had to, you know, Israel established this military blockade, which is very punishing. But again, like, you know, Gaza has a border with Egypt. So, I mean, I, as a Jewish person, don't like to see Israel being, you know, oppressing people. But at the same time, like there's nothing there that wasn't a two way street. Mm. Israel just has more power. Yeah. But it's not that the, it's woke mentality that the Arabs made no choices and had no agency. They had a lot of agency in the way the situation went down. And so both sides are like very culpable. Egypt is called. I mean, everybody played a role here. I don't have a theory why other Arabs don't like Palestinians. Um, I'm kind of worried about it anymore, though. I don't think it's about not liking them. Um, okay. Although Kuwait did, Kuwait, a number of countries kicked them all out. So there were uh, thousands in, in Kuwait's, I think it was 130,000 Palestinians. And they they wow. kicked all of them out. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, and there are there are a number of other countries, including Egypt, that kicked all the Palestinians out as well because they kept fucking attacking Egypt, um, which is like, I, I mean, I don't know what that's about. But here's I, I don't think it's about other people not liking Palestinians necessarily, although there is some caste situation going on where they don't they're not real, quote unquote, real Arabs or whatever the fuck. Uh, and then, you know, it used to be kind of a rally cry from Palestinians themselves. Like, oh, we're not Arab, we're Palestinian. It's like, all right, mm -hmm. cool, dude. It's like saying you're from Texas, but you're not American. Just shut the fuck up. <laughs> um, but <clears throat> this is this is what I think. I think that the Middle East is perfectly happy to keep Palestinians right where they are and fund their terrorism so Israel is forced to respond because the 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 optics are not great for Israel and, and that it boosts recruiting for jihadists throughout the Muslim world and not just fucking uh overt jihadist but you know wahhabism itself you know mm -hmm. the, the stuff that they teach even in saudi arabia and madrasas 82 percent of their schools are madrasas there at their primary education facilities and the west um on the other side is perfectly happy to to continue proxy funding both israel and the terrorists because they do fund we, we we directly fund hamas the west does mm -hmm. through qatar we have been mm -hmm. since they won those goddamn elections in 2006 probably before that frankly mm -hmm. um the West is perfectly happy to continue to keep Israel right there, fund them and fund the terrorists so Israel can be a lightning rod in the region and serve as something of a point man for the GWAT, right? Um, what, here's what I know for sure, that 
both of those things are at best amoral, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, if you're going to make a decision to put somebody at risk, it should be yourself. Um, otherwise you're a fucking coward. Mm -hmm. Um, so those, from those two amoral deals, here's what you're going to get. The American taxpayer is going to foot the bill for most of it. Mm -hmm. That's one. Uh, the jihadists and the American military industrial complex will win no matter who wins the actual wars. They win the fucking actual fight. Um, and then the people of Israel and Palestine will pay the ultimate price for it. And that'll continue, right? That's, so we are stuffing Israeli citizens, civilians, uh, some, to some degree IDF people as well, but that's war. That happens. But Israeli civilians, Palestinian people are getting fed into a meat grinder so our military industrial complex can make money at the same time jihad is boost recruiting they've got good optics uh for whatever their next fucking attack is going to be and uh the american taxpayer is going to pay for it we and and israel doesn't win and america doesn't win in this fight so we if you're if you're in that position if you find yourself in a strategic position where what you're doing is causing the other side to win that's fucking stupid uh, I agree with everything you just said. So then that doesn't mean that there's a fucking solution there, right? Like I, that is that, that I think it definitely illustrates the problem, but frankly, if, if what I'm hearing in the press right now about Iran's involvement and being able to prove that and training these people and that for that paragliding thing there's no way they did that in israel right the, or i'm sorry in, in gaza they didn't train for that in gaza no no fucking possibility israel would have noticed that immediately um but if what i'm hearing about iranian involvement is true i think that israel has all the justification it needs to fucking light iran up and i i'm i'm shocked frankly that they haven't yet i'm shocked by a number of things i'm shocked by <sighs> Israel has a very good intelligence service, extremely yeah. good. They don't have the same um, technical capabilities that the U.S. has necessarily, but they have extremely good capabilities in that regard. They also have Palestine pretty much pinned down. Now, I know there are tunnels everywhere, and that's part of it, right? Um, but they have them pretty well surveilled. And I, yeah. don't, I don't believe that this caught everybody unaware any more than I think 9-11 caught us unaware, frankly. So, like, there's a lot of fucking problems here. And the way that we're executing this is very clearly wrong, right, from every person. I don't mean morally wrong. I mean incorrect tactically. It's fucked mm -hmm. up. Not just this past couple of weeks, but the entirety of how we've handled this, to include what you said before about, you know, Netanyahu basically inventing Hamas in the same way that we invented the fucking, we turned the Mujahideen into Al-Qaeda, and then we turned the sons of Iraq and Iraq into ISIS that spread throughout the region as well. We've done this over and over again. You know what I mean? Um, so if you're Israel, what do you what do you think the reaction should like? OK, let's give in. Yeah. A massive intelligence failure. Mm. These people should be strung up, you know, in the streets. Everyone who had played a hand. What, what do you think Israel's response should be? Well, I think it should be the response that was coming before this attack happened, which was Netanyahu going to prison for the rest of his life and all of his um, cabinet going away as well. I mean, you got yeah. uh, I, you guys, you're American. The Israelis were this close to civil war. Right. Because Netanyahu was doing some crazy shit with regard to gobbling up power, eliminating the judicial branch, essentially, of, of uh, out, out of the way so they could kind of do whatever they want with carte blanche, right? I mean, it would be, imagine the U.S. where Congress could pass any law they wanted to in, in violating the Constitution and there's no recourse through the courts. That's essentially the what we would, he was trying to set up there. So, you know, it, it's very clear, that it, it is demonstrably clear that Netanyahu has no... He has no intention on having a peaceful solution to any of this stuff, right, ever. Mm -hmm. Like, that's not what he wants. He created the fucking threat in the first place just because he didn't like the way the politics were going. So he's got to go, right? I mean, the Israeli mm -hmm. people should fucking throw him into the ocean, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, and they would be right to do so. In the same regard, no matter what he did or what the Israeli government's done, as far as if, if, you, if you buy it fully into the apartheid uh, rhetoric, if Iran was involved in this shit, you know, and over a thousand Israeli civilians were killed as a result, they should fucking nuke Tehran, frankly. I think they should wipe that fucking country off the map. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that doesn't really sit parallel to me saying we shouldn't kill civilians, but that, that 
th th this is the last time we faced an enemy like this. That was the only solution for it. Otherwise, we were going to lose. We were going to be in a war for another 20 years with an enemy that was content to live in fucking caves or live in holes in the jungle or live on little islands and shit like that. Mm -hmm. we, we can't, it just can't be done, right? So I, if, <laughs> I don't know how that would sit with the uh, Arab world that much, but it's only Iraq that's the other Shia-dominated country, right? So what the fuck are they going to do? Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, but, you know, it, that, that's just me being angry about, about the things that have happened. I don't think that that's not a legitimate thing to do. So, you know, it, it's, Iran's been a very confusing country for some time, ever since we, in the 50s, completely butt-fucked that country. You know what I mean? Um, we, we, us and the British, just completely destroyed that place. Um, and it took, it took 20 years to really fuck it up, but after that 20 years, it was bad. Um, I still see these polls that like 80% of people 35 and under in Iran don't support any of this shit. It's like, I don't know if I believe that. Like, who's taking that poll? You know what I mean? Is it? Yeah, I mean, it's also like, it's really sad to say this because I wouldn't have the courage to do this. But like, around the whole conversation about like women in Afghanistan and like women's rights and how could we leave them and how could we not be there? What about all these women who won't be able to go to school? Like, at some point, like, you can't give people civil rights like they have to fight for it mm. themselves like they have to want it themselves like you they you can't give gift someone a democracy and if they can't if they're not going to fight for it and i i say that as a person who's not sure i would be brave enough to i see these women in iran like waving their hijabs and uncovering mm. their hair and getting killed for it and they're so freaking brave but like unless their men are willing to stand up for their rights and it's just yeah yeah, it's yeah. it's not yeah. uh, it's you can't not a want great it situation. For someone. No, you yeah. can't. Yeah, you can't. Uh, I mean, it's it's a tale as old as time. You can lead a horse to water, right? But people, right? Um, what what did what did Reagan say? It's like uh, uh, freedom is always one generation away from extinction. You know what I mean? It's and it, and it falls in line with this idea of a quote unquote more perfect union. It is a it's just like your health, like your diet, like exercise, like your mental acuity. It requires constant monitoring, right, and maintenance. And if you're not willing to do that, then you're going to get what you get, which is the premise of the show. You can either bitch and moan about your rights or and you'll have somebody secure those rights for you and you'll be a, uh, a subject under their rule or you can secure them yourself and be a citizen, right? And people, historically, there have only been a couple of places where people have really fought hard to do that, you know, like the uh, in uh, with starting, I guess, kind of with the Magna Carta and then mm -hmm. uh, the French Revolution and things like that, and even the German, you know, uh, Lutheran uh, Revolution as well, to some degree against the Church. Um, and then you know, the the Northern European countries, and then finally the United States. But it's been noticeably absent in the Arab world, and I I, I don't understand necessarily why that is, but it is, right? And you can't take, you can't go into an authoritarian place and tell people that there's no authority anymore, right? That's like trying to go cold turkey off heroin or something. It just doesn't work. Uh, and we are hopelessly naive to think it would. But I don't, like, pe people, that's one of the main criticisms of the GWAT. Like, oh, we, how, we were never going to get people to blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, that wasn't really the point. The point was right. $8 trillion to the military-industrial right. complex, right? right? right. Um, right. So, yeah, it's a... It's a hopeless situation i don't think that that's why i don't necessarily think uh if you're uh if something was stuck in a blender at the bottom and it's just rattling around and you couldn't get the blender to stop it doesn't make a lot of sense to reach down there and try to grab it no matter how precious the thing is you know what i mean it's there's not going to be a positive result out of that so i kind of feel like let the car crash let these people sort it out and then we'll fucking clean up afterwards i know that's to some degree inhumane but it is what it is. What I don't, what I can't stomach though, is as you you pointed out before, th there is so much parallel between the woke nonsense that goes on in America and the shit that goes on in the Arab world. Um, <clears throat> it's like, man, just, just insane stuff. Like the, these people who are on uni in university campuses who are walking around tearing down the pictures of kidnapped people what possible motivation could you have for doing that i don't understand that i've thought a lot about this because it's 
so sociopathic. Um, I it's I think it's because in the woke mindset, just like there's no innocent white person, there's no innocent Jew. So when they're faced with evidence of just like the purest victim, you know, like a Holocaust survivor who's been taken hostage, mm. a nine year nine month old hostage, you know, a baby, um, they have to they have to literally tear down and erase the evidence because it is it is such an abomination to the woke worldview that a Jew could be victimized rather than being the oppressor that they literally have to erase it like it they're they're such sociopaths it's almost funny I mean I'm laughing because it's like it's just so insane and um I don't know if you saw the whole that this was really funny did you see the Greta Thunberg oh, yeah. thing with the with the octopus god what a fucking retard man <laughs> i mean what the fuck is up with this i mean she she's like uh like the probably the most effective crisis actor of all time right yeah but it was amazing i mean she literally brought down the climate movement with like this stupid little stuffed animal as if anyone yeah. cared about this stuffed animal oh she right? yeah, well like... this this week she's protesting <laughs> the wind farms that she spent the last five years protesting for right it's so insane. it's like the the protest mindset becomes and it, it this is the case for anything whether it's uh it whether it's healthcare right healthcare becomes an industry so we're no right, longer right, interested right. in healthcare we're interested in customers now right mm -hmm. uh and then the same thing happens with any kind of justice movement whatsoever whether it be you know professional unions th this happened with them or any cause whatever it happens to be that's why we, it's why the BLM movement happens. Like we got to a point where racism wasn't really a big deal, to be honest. Like right. people just, it just wasn't affecting people much anymore, but this entire industry had been built up around, you know, ending racism. It's like, Oh fuck. Well, we better find some shit. You know what I mean? Cause to, I a, mean, sa same thing with the me too movement, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's ridiculous, it's man. Thing. So, I mean, I, so I, I like the, I think a lot of people get caught up to it caught up in it uh and with noble intentions too which is unfortunate because you know it's the same thing with how things went down after 9 11 our our patriotism got weaponized against us you know yeah. what I mean? and it's happening yeah. it happens like it, your empathy will always be weaponized against you by fucking totally. authoritarian governments that's just the way it is so you know that's why it's really important to fucking ask difficult questions and if somebody calls you an anti-Semite for it, or if somebody calls you uh, a terrorist supporter for it, or whatever it is, they can go fuck themselves. Frankly, like asking questions. And getting I thought you were going to be like, wear that label proud. No, 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 no. I'm I mean, I guess you could, um, but yeah, I don't. Just, just <sighs> saying, saying no is really important. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's hard for a lot of people to do it because it makes them feel awkward, I guess, but. Um, yeah. some, it, it, and, and, you know, one final thing, it's perfectly reasonable not to take a side in a fight between two assholes. Um, we've gotten to this point in, in the West where we feel like we need to have a hard opinion one way or the other on things. And it used to be like people on the news might, people who are experts in a particular industry might have hard opinions on stuff and everybody else is like, oh, well, this guy thinks that, I guess. But now it's like, why are we asking ordinary people with nine to five jobs to weigh in on this shit, frankly? Like, yeah, you're entitled totally. to your opinion. That's certainly the case. But uh, what is it adding? And how much are you exposing yourself to fucking unnecessary risk by, by doing that? I, not, totally. that, not that you should fucking hide. Not that you should go full Anne Frank or anything. But uh, <clears throat> I had to slip one of those in. Um, what do you think about Anne Frank just publishing her diary? What the fuck, man? It was her diary. I never even thought of that, like, that it was private. Mm. Yeah, what a dick move. Yeah, I literally well, the... never thought of that. Wow. What are you going to do? You know? I think it's more offensive that they took out, like, the sex stuff. Oh, yeah. Why? I mean, I don't understand that. I, I understand yeah. why the little uh, graphic novel booklets that were being given to kids about it were removed because, you know, uh, well, hashtag me too. Yeah. But I like, uh, <laughs> that's unnecessary. We don't need to program our kids or anything probably. Totally. Right. Um, but yeah, you know, history is history. It is what it yeah. is. Like tearing it down. Doesn't it, if it, it's ripping down these posters 
of these kidnapped people to me reads the same as trying to remove things from history. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It's like you're mm-hmm. trying to whatever you think or believe is getting too close to that thing. So you need to fucking obfuscate it. That's what it feels like. Mm-hmm. But you're a journalist, yeah. so you can't do that, right? <laughs> Um, I can only do it in my capacity as a spy for the state of Israel, but um, if I get caught, then the, the gig is up. Yeah, I guess. Uh, I don't know that there would be that heavy a penalty for that, though, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, not in this country, anyways. Uh, we got we to gotta cl- wrap up here. Uh, I really always enjoy talking to you and having reasonable conversations. This is more reasonable than the first conversation we had about this issue, certainly. But, you know, that's the point of having an ongoing dialogue about stuff. Yeah. So we can, Thanks you know, for, sort of for, for being a person who it's always totally rewarding to disagree with. Oh, yeah. You can light me up. I don't give a shit. <laughs> right. I mean, my, my response to being challenged on something is to put all my facts out and be like, all right, does that make sense? Because if it does, then now we can talk about it. Um, tell tell everybody where they can find you and find your work. Um. I can't, um, in good conscience, tell people to go to Twitter because it's so terrible. Um, <laughs> but I am on Twitter. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm the opinion editor at Newsweek, and I have a new book coming out in April. So hopefully, I'll be back to discuss that, mm-hmm. if I may. Um, yeah, it's about um, who is the American working class, and do they have a fair shot at the American dream? And I'm very excited for you to read it, Dan, and tell me what you make of it um, when it comes out. When's it? Uh, when's it out? Uh, it's out in April. Um, well, I mean, like, when's it, when do you finish with it, though, so I can read it before? Oh, it, I just got the copy at its back, oh, so sweet. it's done. Cool. Mm. What? When are you going to record the audiobook? Oh, well, somebody has to buy the audiobook first, so, yeah, it'll be a while, yeah. Why? Because um, then they, I guess they, I don't know. That's just how it worked with the first book. <laughs> <laughs> if I may give you some advice. Oh, yeah. Just uh, record it? You could just record it. Yeah, you could come here and record oh. it in our studio if, if you want. Um, oh, pretty maybe I'll do Pretty that. easily, yeah. And then you can, you can, all you do is upload. If nobody's bought the rights to it, you upload it to um, uh, directly to Audible and associate your personal bank account with it. And the money goes right into your bank account with a 30% fee that Amazon oh, wow. takes, obviously, yeah. Oh, that never even occurred to me. 65% of uh, book sales are Audible now. Wow. Did I get undersold on the Audible for my first book? Yes, <laughs> almost certainly. <laughs> Usually, like, the publisher will charge you 15 to 25 grand to record the damn thing in the first place. Or they get, you know, a percentage of the sales. But unnecessary. You could just pay somebody independently probably mm. five grand to record and edit the whole thing for you. I mean, if it's like 160 to 260 pages or so, like a normal, yeah. normal book. Yeah. yeah, it's not that hard. Cool. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I'll keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for having me. This was um, such a wonderful conversation. I learned a lot. And um, thank you for your open-mindedness and your kindness and your friendship, which has become very important to me. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, and thank you as well for all of those things and for coming on the show today. I appreciate it. Anytime. Yep. We'll have you back soon as soon as the book's out. Uh, And thank you all for listening. This has been Citizen. Citizen.